Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you've joined us today. I'm Sarah. This is Micah. We're the pastors at the Vine Church in Pasco, and we're just glad to be together. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Speaking of joining us, we do have live services going on Sunday mornings. You're welcome to join us as you feel comfortable, but also we have an event coming up we want you to know about. On July 17th from 2 to 4 in the afternoon, it's a Saturday afternoon, we're going to have a block party and we're renting a big water obstacle slide course and uh, we'll have games, we'll have shade, we'll have uh, snow, uh, snow cones. cones. I couldn't think of what they were called. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a fun day and we hope that you'll consider coming out to do an outdoor activity with us on July 17th. Super excited and hopefully get to meet some of our neighbors. It's mm -hmm. been such a slow opening that we're excited to be able to do neighborhood events slowly and safely but start to do those mm -hmm. um, now. So we're going to continue today in the book of Ephesians. We've been in a series going through the letter of Ephesians and I love the flow uh, if you just look at the big picture of Ephesians, I love the flow of Ephesians. The first half is what God has accomplished through Jesus. It's the gospel story, and Paul describes it in detail. And then the latter half of the letter, Paul focuses on how the Christians are to walk in the way of love and how uh, that's kind of more our part in the story. What, what, how, what is our response to what God has accomplished in Jesus? And, and one of the reasons why I love this flow is because it begins with what God has done. It begins with God's grace and God's love and God drawing us in. And then from that place of profound love and grace, then Paul begins to describe what we're called to do. And so it's a really exciting, exciting series. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're still in the first half of the book. And we've talked about spiritual blessings in Christ. We've looked at Paul's prayer for the Christians in, in Ephesus that they may know God more and more. Um, and last week we talked about being made alive in Christ. And then today we're going to continue that conversation. Paul is going to further describe what it looks like, what happens when we're made alive in Christ. So, before we dive into the text, I have a bit of a confession and story to tell. When I go out to eat at restaurants, um, I typically go for sandwiches or hamburgers or something like that. It turns out I am not a great salad eater. <laughs> With a side of fries, right? Oh yeah, always fries. And, and not I... sweet potato fries, mind you. He does not do No one sweet. eats those, at any rate. So, I'm not a great salad eater. Um, and... Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a rabbit. I'm not interested <laughs> in just lettuce uh, for a meal. However, there is an occasion, and a couple like the Grays is the restaurant that I, I'll order a salad there. Uh, but I, if I'm ordering a salad, it's always the Cobb salad. Now, there's a reason. The Cobb salad has bacon and avocado and diced tomatoes Egg. and cheese and chicken and all these things on a salad. Now, that's something I can get interested in. <laughs> Occasionally. Okay. <laughs> now, today, Paul is going to describe the church, and he's going to describe diversity, the diverse aspects of people of different cultures and backgrounds coming together as a beautiful element and opportunity in the church. And kind of like I'm sometimes turned off by a salad that's all green, uh, I think sometimes um, we lose sight of what the church should be, and the community looks in at our churches saying, there's just, this isn't a beautiful picture. Now, Paul's going to describe for us a very diverse and beautiful picture of the church. Let's dive in and see what he has to say about it. So we're going to start in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create 
in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. All right. So if you were with us last week, uh, you might remember um, that, that Paul drew this picture of before and after. In your life, you were in this state of death uh, and brokenness and sin. And in Christ, you have been given new life. He paints this before and after picture. Now, this week, he continues on that theme. But instead of speaking of our individual lives, he begins to speak of our corporate life. Uh, once you were a part of this people or this nation or uh, this group, and now you are a part of this new and beautiful thing, speaking of the church. He begins speaking in terms of circumcision. I remember as a youth pastor, uh, you know, and we're studying through books of the Bible, and we'd come across uh, these sorts of passages, and my uh, standard uh, response or comment was, um, so circumcision represented something very power, powerful in the Israelite nation. Uh, if you're not familiar with what circumcision is, go home and ask your parents. And I'll invite you to do the same if you're not familiar with what circumcision is. But it does represent something very significant. Uh, what it represents, it is the mark of the sign of the physical sign that they were a part of the covenant people of God. Mm -hmm. And so Paul says, remember, uh, he continues in verse 12, says, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So Paul here is continuing to describe how the Gentiles, the non-Jews, were not a part of that covenant that God had made with, the, with Israel. So they were separate from Christ and that Christ, that even the word Christ means the anointed one which was the Jewish phrase for the Messiah, the king, the long-awaited king that would come to redeem Israel. And so they were excluded from, from Israel, from citizenship in Israel, separate from this long-awaited Messiah, and so foreigners to the covenant that God had made with his people. Now, if you're not familiar with that covenant, God made the covenant, first of all, with Abraham, and then he continued um, to make that covenant with, with others, uh, with the nation of Israel and God basically said I will be your God and you will be my people and through you I will bless all nations yeah and so he paints this picture of before in the first couple verses of this section he paints this picture of the Gentile people now he's writing to a primarily Gentile audience he's writing to the churches in Ephesus and the surrounding region these are the churches outside of Israel so yes uh, there are Jewish members in these churches, but a large portion of the audience is Gentile, that is people of other nations, the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and whoever else is living there in Ephesus. And he's saying, once you were not a part of this, but he doesn't say that as an insult to them. Instead, he's setting up that be before picture mm -hmm. so that he can highlight the beauty of the here and now. And so, verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. So, as, as Micah says, Paul's describing how they were separate before. He's saying, but now, Jesus has changed everything. The Messiah has come, and those of you who were far away have now been brought near. And it's so important for us to remember as we look back at this, that God's intent in making his covenant with the Israelite people was always that he would bless all nations through Israel. It wasn't about picking favorites. It was about working specifically with one nation 
to bless all the nations. In fact, um, in, in the Old Testament, we see how Israel was to be a light to all the nations. And so there's this overarching grand story of God working in the world. You know, you can go back and listen to our Mission of God series that we completed before this if, if you want to hear more on that. There's this overarching story. And now Jesus, at this point in the story, is bringing about this blessing that God had promised through the nation of Israel. Right. It specifies that through the blood of Christ, you have been brought near. Have you ever, have you ever been excluded? Have you ever been mm. left out? We all have. It happened in our schooling. It happens in our workplaces. Mm. It happens in our social circles. And uh, and, and what, what Paul is describing here is a beautiful invitation to belong. Like through Christ, mm. through his blood, his sacrifice, uh, he has invited you to be in the inner circle. And it's so of, so often we read this as though, yeah, we are that inner circle and other people are invited in. What he's actually saying is you Gentiles, us, yeah. you know, uh, you were invited in. You have been adopted mm -hmm. into this. And he'll go, into, go on to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. You know, I think as we read the New Testament, sometimes it's it's easy to overlook or gloss over the reality of the challenge that the first century church was facing. And Paul's speaking to it. Now, the readers of this in Ephesus and surrounding region, they were very aware of the uncomfortable and challenging nature of coming together to worship with such different cultural norms and eating standards and uh, I mean there was such complex issues mm -hmm. that they had to deal with to come together and worship together and um, and Paul here is speaking to them saying I want you to remember that in Jesus and in his sacrifice you have been made one and he has brought peace in fact he says he is our peace, that Jesus is our peace, that in him, despite all the differences, and um, by the way, the differences are not negative. We set that up in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We'll get to it in a minute. But in spite of all the differences, Jesus is our peace, and in him, there is hope of unity. And, and Paul says here that he's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility. So what is this dividing wall of hostility? Well, between, um, in Jesus's time, there was just hostility between the Jews and the other nations. And so here Paul is saying that Jesus has destroyed that hostility, that enmity between those, um, those peoples. Interestingly enough, there was also a physical wall so that's more feared, but also a, a physical wall in the temple, the way the temple was built and designed with the courtyards, there was a physical wall separating um, where the Gentiles could be and where the Jews could be. In studying about this, I came across um, in Acts chapter 21, and I'd totally forgotten this, so I was so interested when I came across this, but Paul was actually, one of the reasons why he was arrested in Acts 21 was because he was accused of bringing a Greek into that mm. that court that was for Jews only. So there was a, a physical wall um, in the temple, but there were also less tangible barriers. There was a separation between Israel and all the other nations. And that was commanded in the Torah. The Israelites were to be set apart from the other nations. And so Paul speaks to that and he says um, he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And what he means by that setting aside the law is that in Jesus, in that Jesus is setting aside the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles that resulted from the law. So it's not just throwing the law in the trash. That's not what he's doing here. In fact, Jesus himself said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He's saying we're going to set aside that separation. It's, I think it's really, it's, it's a complex thing to understand 
one really important thing to remember in all this is that scripture is, is directional. It's a developing story. And so here, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the long-awaited king, was a major development in the story. He came, his death, his resurrection significantly changed. And you see that here, significantly changed how Israel is going to interact with other nations. So last week in the first half of Ephesians 2, um, Paul's describing our former state, and he says, you are deserving of wrath, and yet God in his great mm -hmm. mercy, you know, uh, saved you. And uh, in the same way, I see that in this text. Um, of all the things that Jesus could have destroyed to bring about peace and mm -hmm. unity, uh, people or cultures or whatever else, what this clarifies was destroyed was the barrier wall. The dividing walls, the hostility, mm -hmm. the enmity. Jesus came to bring peace by destroying anything that would divide, by destroying the hostility that existed. I think that's a beautiful message. Mm -hmm. Paul continues, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility says to create in himself one new humanity. So he's just, Paul's described the, the, the separation that existed, Jesus removing that mm -hmm. hostility, that barrier. And now he writes that all these different people groups are being made into one new humanity. You know, I think sometimes um, today and also historically, this has been misunderstood um, and misinterpreted as um, and when we come to know Jesus, we leave behind our former identity and culture and heritage. Um, and that's not the case. That's not what Paul is saying here. Rather, this, this one new humanity coming together is this beautifully diverse, multicultural, multi-ethnic, global family of God. And the miraculous, beautiful part here is that people of different backgrounds and customs and cultures and different languages can be one in Jesus, one new humanity. And Paul's going to continue to talk about what this oneness, what this unity looks like later on in the letter. Absolutely. He says, so uh, Christ has come and his sacrifice has reconciled you to each other, that in community you can be reconciled to God mm -hmm. through the cross is the movement that mm -hmm. he's making here. Uh, he put to death the hostility, the things that could divide. Uh, and he took, in fact, in himself, I thought this was an interesting point, Jesus took on the hostility of both sides. Here he speaks of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and Jesus took on the hostility of the Jewish people, feeling threatened by Jesus and the changes coming about in their nation. Um, uh, he took on the hostility as the Jews had him arrested. He took on the hostility of the Romans, of the Gentiles, as he hung on a cross. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus, all the hostility has been absorbed and taken from the church that we have opportunity to live in unity. Paul continues in verse 17. He came, speaking of Jesus, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who who were near for through him we both have access to the father by one spirit jesus came and preached peace now this could be understood literally he speaks of peace he promises mm -hmm. peace to his disciples on the sermon on the mount he kicks off uh, early in that sermon saying blessed are the uh, peace the peacemakers. Um, so he speaks, yes, of peace, but what's so significant about, of, about Jesus is that he not only speaks of it, he lives it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, he demonstrates nonviolence in all aspects of his life and ministry and his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the things that Paul is alluding to here in verses 17 and 18 is some of the prophecies of Isaiah. In Isaiah 52, um, uh, uh, the author celebrates that God will come and comfort his people, like mm -hmm. this bringing of peace. Or in Isaiah 57, he says, peace, peace to those who are far and those 
who are near. Paul is kind of yeah. using the same language, referencing it. Remember that it is in Jesus that peace will come. Yes, to you, Israel, comfort to you, Israel, but peace to all mm -hmm. who are far and all who are near. And in verse 18, for through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. I love this language in here. Through Jesus, all people, Paul says both, because in that time, that was the categorization that they were using. But really, speaking of all peoples, all different nations, all peoples have access to the Father by one spirit. I love the Trinitarian language. In here, a God who exists in community, a God who exists in relationship, working to draw all peoples into relationship. And so we all have access to God. Later on in, in Ephesians 3, Paul's going to say, in Christ, we, we can approach God with freedom mm -hmm. and with confidence. What, what a blessing. What a beautiful opportunity there. So, consequently, because of all that Christ has accomplished, um, destroying the barriers and the hostility, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Let me say, to Israelite culture and to many of the cultures and, and nations represented in the church in Ephesus and the region around, um, this is beautiful language. I mean, family was everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you save face for your family. Your actions bring honor or shame to a whole household and people. This is the way they thought and the way their culture worked. And so he says, you have been adopted into, you are citizens of God's household. You are members of his household. Um, you, in all of your diversity there in Ephesus, in all of the different nations represented in this church, you all come together to represent the people of God, God's family here on earth. And Paul continues with a building analogy in verse 20. Built, all of you built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So the foundation being the, the apostles and the prophets, the people who told them about Jesus built on the chief cornerstone and that analogy referring to Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the King. Now, I don't know much about building buildings. I'm not much of an engineer. That's not my forte. But, but here's the idea of the chief cornerstone, that the entire building is aligned with and rests on and built off of this one stone. And so Paul is addressing the, the Gentile Christians here, and he's saying, you too are members of this household. You've been brought in, and this community is built on Jesus and is growing into a global church. Mm -hmm. And as he concludes this section uh, that we'll look at today, uh, don't miss the temple language. Mm -hmm. it, it's been alluded to throughout, including our text mm -hmm. today. But he says, in him, the whole building, Jesus, in Jesus the whole building is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And in him, you're being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see, in the nation of Israel, the temple was the hub of faith and daily life. But the temple was special because it was a sacred dwelling place mm -hmm. Of God, It was where heaven was to meet earth. This is where God was to dwell. And this transition cannot be overstated. As he says to you, the church, you are the temple. You are being built into this place where heaven and earth meet the place in which God will dwell. I love, I love that. I love that language. In him, you two are being built together into the dwelling place of God. You know, the last few years in my personal faith journey, um, growing in my awareness of the Holy Spirit has been just beautiful. It's something that, that was I really needed. And in this last few years, I've found a lot of comfort and peace listening to the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me and experiencing and engaging and interacting with the Holy Spirit. It's been very profound and transformative for me and so, so good. It's important here in this text, as we read about the indwelling of the Spirit, that Paul here is, is speaking 
about the indwelling spirit in a, in a different way. He's saying he is not talking about the individual indwelling of the spirit. Rather, here he's speaking to the group. He says, in him you too are being built together. That you is plural. That's the y'all. <laughs> in him y'all, all of you are being built together into this dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, yes, lives inside each of us, and, and we have the opportunity and blessing to engage with the Holy Spirit and experience the Holy Spirit. And also, the Holy Spirit dwells within us as a community, as a church, as a body, uh, as the body of Christ, as the family of God. And so again, this progression is, is beautiful. You see, Jesus destroys the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus creating one new humanity, this beautifully diverse family of God, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within this community. And what I've noticed that it's not quite so linear as I like to describe it like that. Like the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us as a community while at the same time transforming us to be that one new humanity and to look like the people of God that God intends. Mm -hmm. So as we zoom out, we see the larger scope of his message in this section today. Um, he says, once you were separate, but in Christ you have been brought together and you have been reconciled both to each other uh, there is no more hostility that, that exists between you. Uh, Christ took that on and it is done with. Uh, you have been brought together and reconciled to each other and you have been brought together and in community reconciled also to God. You are the church invited to be a part of his household, his people. Hmm. You know, when we talk about this idea of reconciliation, especially in reference to, to being reconciled to each other. Uh, humanity doesn't do well with that. And sadly, the church, the global church, doesn't always do well with that. I don't have to list for you all the divisions that do exist and the hostility that is, is present. And I don't know if you at times, um, like, me, like me, feel a little bit overwhelmed by it all just the the division and the hostility and 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 what is that should not be sometimes um it can feel a little bit hopeless it can feel it can feel a bit depressing and this passage really encourages me and i hope it encourages you too that there is good news in jesus and, and part of that good news is that Jesus is about tearing down walls. Jesus is about tearing down hostility, destroying the barriers. And Jesus is our peace. Jesus brings about peace. And in Jesus and through the Spirit, God is reconciling people not only to God, but also to each other. So we have reconciliation to God and reconciliation with others. And as the family of God, this global family of God, we're being built into this beautiful, diverse, um, crazy at times community. Um, but unity is possible. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just really encouraging to me, really hopeful that loving each other with respect and honor and, and being united under Jesus is possible. Now I will say it takes a lot of effort and it doesn't happen at the snap of the fingers when we think, oh, well, if we just all believe in Jesus, then we'll have peace with, with no effort. That's not how it is. And Paul's actually going to talk about that in Ephesians 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. But today I want us to remember, we'll get there, but today I want us to remember that unity is possible. Reconciliation in Jesus is possible and that's what the good news is the gospel news that jesus brings about peace and so in jesus we are invited to live into this new way of being a new way of engaging with each other 
So as we move forward this week, what does it look like to live this out in our lives? First of all, recognize that you have been invited into the family of God, that we as a people, as a church, have been uh, reconciled to God and to each other. And so we attune our eyes to the beautiful mosaic that is the church, that is the people of God. We attune our eyes to differences and celebrate them. We do not strip off our cultures or our anything else in life, but instead we come in all our uniqueness and beauty and celebrate together what God is bringing together. And in the ways we interact as a church and with each other and in the world around us. We choose the way of peace, the way of Jesus. He is our peace. He has torn down the hostility and invites us to engage intentionally in the peace that he brings. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for what you have done. Lord, that you are our peace and that you are all about tearing down walls of hostility. And God, we confess that there are walls and, and there is hostility and division, Lord. And so I just pray that you would tear those down, that you would teach us how to be peacemakers, Lord, and that our lives would glorify you, Lord, as a community, and we'd be able to come together, Lord, and that we would be able to love each other as you intend. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thanks again for joining us this morning. We can't wait to see you again and praying that you have a blessed week. See you soon.